Hi, fools. My name is Rich Griefner. I'm an advisor for our Value Hunters service, and I'm excited to be joined today by Chris Bogart, co-founder and CEO of Burford Capital. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Rich, and thanks for the opportunity. Oh, sure thing. So uh, Burford is the world's largest provider of commercial legal finance. The company has said it wants to be the Goldman Sachs of the legal finance industry. Uh, so Goldman is a household name. Burford, not quite there yet. So, Chris, in our conversation today, uh, I'm hoping we could help our listeners better understand Burford's business, its competitive advantage, and get to know you a bit better. Sound good? Sounds good. Great. Okay, uh, let's start at the start. Uh, can you give me like litigation finance, litigation funding 101? What is it? What problem does it solve? And what role does Burford play in the process? Yeah, absolutely. So, Litigation finance is basically specialty finance that looks at legal assets, claims, litigation matters, arbitrations, looks at those things as financeable assets. So when you think about a, a business, companies often have valuable claims that they're bringing, you know, sometimes it's against other companies, sometimes it's in the context of a multi-company thing that has gone wrong. For example, companies that have been victims of price fixing. Um, and so those claims have value. Um, you could think of them effectively as being like contingent receivables. And just like any other financial asset that has value, you can organize a, a financing package around the value of those assets. And that's exactly what we do. Now, why is that of interest to companies in particular? Um, there are really two parts to that answer. One part is that um, spending operating cash, diverting operating cash from the purpose of your business and putting it into a collateral activity like litigation um, isn't, the, isn't the most value maximizing strategy for companies to engage in. You know, for example, I used to be the general counsel of Time Warner, the media group. So Time Warner had lots of money. It wasn't a question of Time Warner not being able to pay for litigation if it wanted to bring it. But every dollar that we spent on litigation was a dollar that we didn't spend making television or movies or publishing magazines. And ultimately, it's that, it's that core business, the business of publishing and making movies that investors want us to be engaged in. That's the business on which you get a multiple on your profits. Whereas being really good at collateral litigation doesn't get rewarded by investors and doesn't contribute to your market value in the same way. So if you can get a, an alternative to paying your own operating cash for these collateral activities, whether it's litigation or something else that businesses do, you know that's a value. And so we help businesses take those costs off their P&L. We help them keep their operating cash for to be devoted to the things that they really, uh, you know, are the, the core business of doing. So that's sort of part one. Part two is. Um, especially in the world that we're in today, where there is more and more litigation and that litigation can often be quite high value. These claims really do have significant future potential value. Um, and as a result, they are assets that businesses can obtain financing against today, not only just to pay the costs of those cases, but also to generate today cash that the businesses can turn around and use in their operating businesses. And so we do that as well. We effectively monetize the future expected value of litigation today, and we give businesses cash against those values so that they can go and grow and hire employees um, and increase their profitability. Thank you for that overview. So that, that explains why litigation finance, legal finance is beneficial to the corporation. How about from the law firm side? You're, you also provide a benefit to the law firms. We do because ultimately the law firms, you know, most of the law firms that we work with are law firms that are, have an hourly fee business model. They, they charge clients for their time. Um, and law firms don't really have access to the capital markets. You know, as, as, as you know, you can't go and buy stock in a U.S. law firm. It's not permitted for you to do that. Um, and so what that means from the law firm perspective is the only way for law firms to get capital into their business is by borrowing it from the bank. Um, and they would prefer not to do that. They would prefer another more sophisticated financial party like us to, to be in the market intermediating that capital. And they would just like to do the business of law. So they're happy to, to have us 
you know, accommodate the desires of companies for alternative fee arrangements while at the same time not having to go and become financial institutions themselves. And, and by the way, the, the investor side of that coin is that investors don't have very many good ways of getting exposure to the legal industry. And the legal industry is absolutely enormous. Globally, you know, it's, it's roughly the same size as the pharma industry. Um, and, but as an investor, there are very few ways that you can go and get direct exposure to what's going on in that large and profitable industry. And Burford is one of those ways. Thank you for that. I appreciate the overview. So uh, Burford co-founded in uh, 2009, and the company has generated very consistently high returns on invested capital since that time. And that suggests that you guys benefit from strong and sustainable competitive advantages. Uh, the company likes to call out four sources of competitive advantage, your scale, your brand, your expertise, and your data. And I was hoping we could just quickly touch on each of those four categories. So let's start with scale. Why is scale so important in this industry? Scale is important, but, but all of those advantages really link together um, and create a, a pretty substantial moat for, for Burford. Burford is the industry leader by a, a very significant margin, both in terms of, of pure scale. In other words, the number of dollars of capital that we put out. We're sitting today with a, a portfolio that's north of $7 billion in size. Um, we have, you know, more than 150 people spread around the world who do this work, you know, many of whom are experienced former lawyers. Um, and, and what that does, you know, you, you mentioned Goldman Sachs at the, at the beginning of this conversation. Um, when you look at a Goldman or a Blackstone or a KKR or a Morgan Stanley, you know, those firms get a certain amount of business, um, simply because of their size scale and presence. Um, and we benefit from that as well. Were the known quantity in in the legal industry, you'd you'd be hard pressed today to find a, a partner in a major law firm who doesn't know about us um, and doesn't know that our capital and our services are available for their clients. So those are the those are the kinds of competitive advantages that we've built over the last fifteen years, um, and and they also lead to data, um, and data is a very significant competitive advantage for us that comes out of that combination of scale and longevity. The reason the data is important is because litigation is inherently risky. In any piece of litigation, there is, there is idiosyncratic risk of a court, a judge, a jury not agreeing with your position and going in the opposite direction. And when that happens, you know, you have a loss in the case. And when we have a loss in the case, we lose our capital. Um, and so trying to make the best quality investment decision that we possibly can is a significant part of, of what we do here. And one of the things about litigation, of course, is that a fair bit of litigation resolves by settlement, by negotiated agreement between the parties, instead of by a case going all the way to trial. And settlements are usually confidential. And so as a result, it's relatively hard, just based on public data, for you to get a good data set from which to make high quality investment and analytical decisions. And what we have is the benefit now of, because again of our scale and longevity, the largest data set in the industry, which lets us you know, apply significant quantitative rigor to our investment process and to make use of that data to improve our performance. So we're, we're now down, for example, to a loss rate across our portfolio of only about 9%, um, which is very low when you think of, of litigation being brought in large dollar cases where those cases are often pretty evenly matched. Yeah, and, and I just want to double down on that point. You've, you mentioned your large proprietary data set. Uh, this isn't like a typical like request for a proposal where you know anybody can come in and review the documents and place a bid. This is confidential information that requires a lot of due diligence. So it really is true that Burford and maybe say only one other party would ever see these cases coming up. Is that correct? That is correct. And it's not only that it's confidential, it's that it's actually legally privileged. Um, and so when you think about traditional concepts of lawyer client privilege, which everybody knows from the movies, right? You know, you can, you can tell your lawyer that, that you killed the guy and, and that isn't admissible in court. Um, so there's a very, it's, it's difficult to bring yourself underneath that umbrella of legal privilege. 
Um, and we are capable of doing that, which means we can have access to that privileged information that was protected work products information. Um, and that happens in a way that you can't have in sort of an open market competitive dynamic. Yeah. So you guys have proprietary data on thousands of cases and you've been able to see how those play out through the system, what the outcome was. And it's been only recently, the past couple of conference calls that you guys have begun mentioning uh, the potential impacts of artificial intelligence on that proprietary data set. Can you talk a bit about how you guys are using AI in the business and where that might go in the future? Sure. So, so AI and the whole concept of machine learning and and sort of large language models is is highly relevant to what we do, and it's relevant at several different layers. First of all, it's it's important even before you get to making investment decisions with our data. It's important because it it's the question of how you access underlying facts in litigation. Um, you know, today's world is is document heavy. You know, the most litigation is going to turn on what people have said in emails, in text messages, in Bloomberg chats, and so on. Much more that it's going to turn on what somebody, you know, what somebody's memory is of an event that happened years ago. Um, but because we now retain so much of that written information, it's very difficult to to access and assess that information just with human lawyers. And so that's where you see um, significant improvement, significant engagement from AI and, and other data science techniques to, to even before we get to an investment decision, just to figure out what has actually gone on. You know, has there in fact been price fixing here? Are these unconnected facts when linked together suggestive of some, of some bad conduct? And then you add to that the fact that you're going to now take that raw data and you're going to figure out, you know, what is that raw data likely worth in terms of a litigation recovery and therefore a litigation financing investment by us? Um, and we use a significant amount of machine learning um, in that, and that is that just as in AI generally, um, that is both accelerating in the speed of adoption and the speed of use that we have, and it's also having the benefit of declining in cost. Um, and so every cycle turn that goes by makes that more amenable for us and, and gives us the ability to do yet more with it. Yeah. And, and I think that's going to be big for the business going forward. Cause I'm just, you know, you mentioned earlier, the size, the potential total addressable market here is comparable to say the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and you guys are the biggest player in the industry, but your capital commitments that you're making are still relatively small, a very tiny, uh, percentage of what the business that you could be generating. So I'm wondering, what is the big constraint on growth for you guys? Um, is it people? Is it capital? Or is it just uh, these cases are, are idiosyncratic in nature and, and they require a lot of time uh, for each one? All of those things are true, but, but, but it's fundamentally a question of the adoption curve. Um, that's what's really driving our ability to continue to grow. So when you talk about the, the market size, yes. Like if you look at the, you know, legal revenues um, are somewhat around, you know, approaching a trillion dollars a year. And we have grown a lot in this business, but but by growing a lot, that means we're putting out, you know, a billion dollars a year. So a, t a tiny fraction of that of that total market. Now, not all of that trillion dollars is, is ever going to be ultimately addressable to us. So that has nothing to do with the kind of stuff that we do. But, but you've seen a significant level of growth in our business over the last 15 years. That growth appears to be continuing. And what's happening is you see more and more adoption of this product by users, both brand new users to the product and repeat users who use it again and again and use it with, with larger deal sizes. I appreciate that. And speaking of, of larger deal sizes or, or big deals, um, for folks who aren't familiar with this industry, you, you mentioned this a bit, the majority of cases will settle. So about 70% of your cases settle. And when a case settles, Burford typically earns attractive returns with no real litigation risk. Uh, about 8% of your cases go to trial and Burford loses. And in that event, it's a, it's a near complete loss of capital. But there's about 21% of your cases that go to trial and Burford prevails. And that is where the real money comes in. There you're, you're looking to earn multi-bagger returns on your initial 
investment. So that, that's just an asymmetric characteristic of the industry. That's exactly right. And, and it's just common sense when you think about it. Um, you know, litigation is inherently risky. And so if you have a $10 million claim, you're not going to spend $10 million in legal fees to fight that claim. You're going to spend $10 million in legal fees only if you can get to $100 million in, in claim value. And so when we lose cases, yes, it's unpleasant to lose, but we're only losing the, the invested capital that we put into them, the $10 million in that example. When we win, we're capable of winning the entire claim, the $100 million in that example. And the settlements, you know, sort of fill in the middle, the middle range because settlements are an inherently discounted outcome because they're negotiated with the other side. Yeah. And, and the best example that we can provide of a big outlier success is your YPF case. Uh, ordinarily, Burford doesn't reveal much information about the cases in which it invests, but this is uh, so public and so material to your results that you guys have, have discussed this um, quite a bit. So I'm hoping, uh, could we just do like a one minute overview. What is the YPF case? Uh, what's the brief history of it? Where do we stand now and what's next? So, so YPF is, um, is a publicly traded, uh, energy company that's owned by the Argentine government. It was privatized a, a number of years ago. Uh, Argentina then renationalized it. And as it renationalized it, it breached its promises to shareholders to tender for their, their stock in YPF. Um, as a result of that, um, large holders in the stock suffered financial distress because the share price collapsed. Um, it, in particular, um, our clients, the Peterson clients, went bankrupt, and we were appointed by the Spanish bankruptcy court to, to try to get relief for their creditors. Um, in doing so, we brought a case on behalf of those creditors in federal court in New York. That case has gone all the way through the trial process, um, and ultimately, uh, produced a final judgment that is now on appeal. That final judgment in the trial court was for a little bit over $16 billion. Um, and the reason that number is so high is simply because YPF was worth a lot. Um, and there is a formula for calculating that tender offer price that Argentina simply didn't pay. So all the court did ultimately was find that, that both Argentina was liable and the court used the formula to calculate the tender offer. Yeah, and, and you guys have been working on this case for eight or nine years now. So you mentioned uh, Argentina has found liable for about $16 billion in damages. Of that amount, Burford is owed a bit more than $6 billion, which is more than double uh, the company's market cap. So the market is obviously skeptical about your ability to actually collect uh, cash from Argentina. So I know you probably don't want to say too much here, but um, is there anything you could share that might give us some insight into your ability to enforce that judgment against Argentina. I think it's not so much a question of enforcing the the judgment, but the the it, we do a lot of judgment enforcement around the world, and one of the characteristics of of enforcing judgments is that that is a process that inherently discounts the face value of those judgments. And so, even though you've got a judgment sitting there for sixteen billion dollars. Um, ultimately, you'd expect that judgment to be paid through a negotiated process with Argentina, um, and that negotiation is going to result in a discount to that face value. Yes. And uh, I don't know if you can comment on this or not. Argentina's got a new president. Is there anything you can say about how that might impact your ability to collect? Well, only, only just to say, and, you know, it's obviously early days. The new president isn't even in office yet. Um, but only, only to say that, that during the course of the presidential campaign, you know, this judgment, because of its size, did come up, and the new government's position was Argentina needs to take care of its debts. Yeah, the market has certainly responded favorably, so you know, infer from that what you will. Um, it still feels like investors are reluctant to give Burford credit for these big asymmetric winners. Everything is, is basically treated as a one-off, but am I wrong? This is part of the business model. As you mentioned earlier, like, you know, you're not going to pursue an investment in the case unless you think, you know, the juice is worth the squeeze. So should we, should investors be considering big wins, perhaps not on the scale of YPF, but very large litigation wins? Should investors be counting on that as a regular feature of your business? Yes, is the simple answer. Like lit litigation has a pretty predictable pattern of resolution. 
Um, and so the numbers that you gave earlier about the percentage of our portfolio, about 70% that settles, those are pretty typical numbers that you see across a book of, of litigation outcomes. Sometimes they're even higher than that. Um, and so it's a reasonable thing to believe that if you've got a, a big diversified portfolio of litigation, as we do, that, that our portfolio is going to perform consistently with those classic litigation outcomes. A majority of settlements, the cases that go on to trial, some will win, and when they win, they win a lot of money, and some will lose, and when they lose, you lose less money because of that asymmetry that we've already discussed. Yeah, and thank you. And, and YPF is a special investment. There's probably not another YPF in the portfolio, but there are some uh, investments that could produce big winner. So what is the materiality threshold at which you guys will disclose uh, a matter for investors? So the, there are two different answers to that question. One of them doesn't have anything to do with financial materiality. So uh, the reason that, that we are disclosed in YPF is because of our role in the case. Um, and so we were disclosed at the very beginning of that case without regard to financial materiality. And that's true in a number of other cases as well. Some jurisdictions have rules about disclosure. So for example, if we, if we do a case in Singapore, we're going to be disclosed in that case. Um, and so there's some amount of our portfolio that is out there on just, just because of that. In terms of financial materiality, it's almost never the case that the investment that we're making, the cash that we're putting into a case is financially material. Um, the materiality is going to come later when there's been a win in the case. Um, and so when that happens, you've seen us from time to time put out, you know, put out releases that we've won a big case, for example. But, but for the most part, the portfolio, you know, the portfolio performs the way you would expect it to perform. And none of those are individually material events. Trust the process. So um, I've been following the company for a number of years now. I've seen you present uh, many times. I feel like you always bring really good energy. It feels to me like you really enjoy what you do. Um, so I guess, is that the case? And if so, what is it about your job that you enjoy so much? I really do. And the thing that is so fun about this job for John Malone and me, who we founded the business together, is you know, we're taking this industry, the legal industry, that we have been part of for our whole careers. We both started life as practicing lawyers at big law firms. Um, we've taken this industry that is pretty staid, pretty more bound in terms of its finances and its use of capital. And we really have moved it very significantly into a world of being a capital user. And I think that the trend here is going to continue. You know, you still have today a world where in 49 of the 50 states, Arizona being the only exception to this, you know, there is no ability to, to for external capital and, and external investment to go into law firms. I believe that's going to continue to change. I believe Arizona is not going to be the, the first and last state to do that. And so I think as time passes, you're going to see yet more economic activity around law firms. And so if you think about my career, I've been a trial lawyer, I've been the general counsel of a, of a Fortune 50 company, I've been a venture capital investor, so I've, I've got the threads of law and of finance, and this business lets me combine them in an absolutely fascinating way. I get to do, you know, I get to work on some of the most largest and most interesting litigation cases in the world, and I get to do that not only from a litigator's perspective, but also from that of a financier. Yeah, it, and I can just feel the intellectual curiosity. Um, I also feel like your job could probably get pretty stressful at times. Uh, what do you do to unwind? Um, I hike a fair bit. Um, I'm Canadian originally, as you probably have been able to tell at, at some point or other during this conversation. And so I still go up to Canada um, and canoe in the, in the Canadian Northwoods. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. And then you mentioned uh, John Malo co-founded uh, Burford with you in 2009. It, it, you guys, it feels like you guys are both like very prominently involved in the day-to-day -day operations. How reliant is Burford's business on the two of you and what does the bench strength look like? Burford's got great bench strength now. Um, you know, this is a classic startup. John and I started it from nothing. Um, and so in the early years, it was pretty reliant on us, but now we're 15 years in We've got 170 people working in the business, 75 or so of them are lawyers. Um, you know, a number of those people have been with Burford through the years. 
Um, and so we've got a very traditional, you know, multi-layer bench here um, of people who have risen up through the organization and are, are absolutely terrific. Sounds good. And then uh, what, what would you view as the biggest risk factor for the business? Is there anything that keeps you up at night? People ask me that, and, and I think people are often surprised by the answer. Um, the thing that, that I worry the most about as a single sort of black swan event in the business um, relates to information security. Um, not, you know, the portfolio is big and diversified, so I don't worry so much about losing cases. Obviously, we try not to lose cases, but, you know, we're, you know, one, one loss doesn't, doesn't make the business anymore. Um, the reason I say information security is because, you know, we, we talked a few minutes ago about the fact that we get access to the legally privileged information. And so what that means is that Burford is in possession of a lot of information about many of the most sensitive and complicated pieces of litigation out there in the world. Um, and if we were to suffer a, a massive data breach, um, that would be an unpleasant thing, I think, for us. Um, as a result, we spend you know a lot of resource, a lot of time and energy on on questions of information security, um, significantly more than you would normally find being done in a in a business of our size and scale. Thank you, and I know we're we're running up on time, so I'm I'm going to let you get out of here. But before we do, you mentioned uh, that you were in a former life, you were a VC focused on uh, telecom and media, I believe. Uh, is that still something that's that's of interest to you, investing? And uh, can you tell us a bit about your investing stuff? Well, so what I did, uh, I had a, a, a funny progression. So I, I was Time Warner's general counsel, which is obviously, and that was at the at the dawn of the internet um, era. Uh, you know, I started in that role in 1998. Um, and then I moved from that to run Time Warner's advanced technology business and, and dealt with the early days of broadband and voice over IP and, and so on. And then I branched out from Time Warner and, and made my own um, tech media investments, some of which were in the medical space and some of which were still in the, the tech media space. And I, I still absolutely enjoy those fields, um, although I today don't invest in single companies. Um, I spend all of my time working on Burford and, and I, uh, I sadly have given up the, 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 uh, the rush of finding new fascinating young companies to, to help grow. Um, but in terms of style, you know, I'm looking for uh, disruptive technologies. Um, and Burford, even though it's not essentially a technology company, is has that same disruptive element to it. It's just just that we're disrupting the legal industry now instead of instead of a sector of the technology business. I couldn't have said it better myself. Chris Bogart, co-founder, CEO of Burford Capital. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate it.